Hey, good morning. Welcome to Office Hours for February 19th, 2023. Oh. Here, hey everybody. What's up, Stone Mason? What's up, Western Australia, Sicily? Hey, and Long Island, New York in the house. What's up, you guys? Tuning in from all over. Um, it's good, good to see you. Can I, yeah. I can see you, right? I can see you. I can see you in the chat, at least, for sure. Um, kind of an interesting paradigm of our age. I'll see you guys later. And it's like, really? I think maybe you'll see me, but we all do see each other somehow, some way. So Today, 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 getting some higher wisdom, um, pulling it in, seeing what's up. And today is holding together, or union. And it says to seek union with others and with the sage. Holding together denotes a time for creating union with others in order to complement and assist one another. Just as the rain complements and assists the earth, which is an image often associated with this hexagram. In order for your unions to bear the greatest possible fruit, Certain requirements must be met. The first requirement for holding together with others is that we hold together with our own inner truth. This means we adhere to proper principles as a matter of habit, striving always to remain innocent, balanced, and correct. In short, marry the sage first and faithfully, and good fortune will come to other and all other subsequent marriages. The second requirement for holding together with others is we steadfastly resist the clamoring of the emotional inferiors within. Every union meets with challenges, and if we are not resolute against the effects of fear, doubt, despair, anger, no lasting success will be possible in any relationship. This is a good time to ask yourself, if you are dis displaying the steadfast correctness and strength of character that are at the heart of all great unions. Finally, it is the responsibility of one who would like to unite to see that it is possible for others to enjoy the union as well. The desire for community is deeply felt by all humans, and it is the shared responsibility of those on the higher path to make some sort of family available to those in need. In doing so, we pay homage to the sage. So it's kind of nice for me. I always start off the same way, get centered, get some higher advice, get union. I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am on oh, YouTube notified you. Wow, cool. It's working the algorithms up. It's doing its thing. And if George is in the house, we can um, pull up um, some of this. Let me do this new meeting here again and see if this is going to work for us. Because um, I got the um, I got the thing to work. Turns out it was just my audio device last week when we were trying to get George on here. But he gave us a good preview. So if you want to join in there, you can. Um, but otherwise, um, Ben was asking here about the green lasers over Hawaii. He keeps hearing about, I haven't seen any lasers. It has been raining since pretty much after you left, Ben. It's been raining for the past four, three, three weeks, two weeks, three weeks. It hasn't stopped raining, um, which is good. You know, it, it, before that it hadn't, hadn't rained for a month. Now it's been raining for a month, so it's good. Um, so, hey, thanks, Mom and Bird. Hey, yeah, good, good to get some super chats going. Glad you're tuning in here. Um, yeah, the animals need it too, the rain for sure. Um, let's see here. I, since George isn't here yet, I wanted to show you one thing here before I jump into this other presentation. And that is, if I can get this up, put that over there. 
Um, and I want this one. Switch that over. Okay, so you can see my screen here, and it's not actually what I wanted to show you. It was this right here. So here, um, this is my. This is what I see when I look into my uh, YouTube. But here, I put up um, these last five episodes here that I uploaded to my regular YouTube channel, and these are these CanF shorts here. So, for instance, how do we collect IMOs in the desert? Then in this episode of the year 21, month 12, day 5, so December 5th, 2021, we talked about how do we collect IMOs in the desert. And this seven minute clip um, is just a short from this office hour here. It's just like a short condensed little bit of it um, that then becomes the, um, you know, a seven minute YouTube. And so I got one on charring bones, JMS versus IMO, you know, when the pH is up to the point, up to the microbes. So these little shorts, this one was from what, uh, uh, October 24th, 2021. Um, I'm just going through these old, um, all the old office hours and trying to find, uh, interesting clips to upload to the channel and share with you. And, um, I, I built this whole script to do it um, here, but it turns out that um, the YouTube API only lets you upload six videos per day based on 10,000 quota points, and each video takes like 1,800 points to upload. So um, so anyway, it, it ends up being about six videos a day that I can upload using that API if I wanted to from the command line script that I wrote um, to do that. So look forward to more upcoming office hours, more of them coming out to you, like short little clips, because sometimes it's hard to watch a whole hour, right? You get a whole hour office hour and it's nice. You can maybe put it on like I do, like podcast style while you're doing other things or, or watch it live here and get comments and actually um, tune into it. Um, but, um, but been, you know, trying to figure out a way to make this um, message more digestible to more people, create more union, um, you know, with natural farming and with more folks. And so I believe the clips have to be shrunk down and put by topic for, for it to grab you. And I probably have to put some like thumbnails, like, right, every, every YouTube, every YouTube, we look at every YouTube you see and it's like, Right, they're all like, it's it's like that's how the thumbnail and you have to have the lighting right and you have to, you won't believe this, like the clickbait. I just, sometimes I, I kind of hate the YouTube the algorithm that it forces you into this conformity of, you won't believe this solution, right? And then it's like every single YouTube is like that, right? And you just, you just keep scrolling through the YouTube and seeing it and you're just like, oh. And then they all start off and then it's like an advertisement for Masterworks, right? <laughs> You won't believe, by doing KNF, you can save money with, by buying paintings that aren't really paintings that, it's probably, you know, all these, uh, whatever else they're advertising on the, on the internet these days. But, um, yeah, the YouTube formula, right? Make money. Okay, so, or yoga pants. <laughs> I wish they advertised yoga pants, that sounds better than the advertisements I get. Maybe each person has their own um, their own way of advertising. Okay, so George isn't in there. No one else is in there. So, um, <laughs> cool. <clears throat> All right. So, um, here we go. Here we go. Um, I wanted to look at a little bit of this. Um, go back to Master Cho's presentations and get into those. Um, so this is where we left off last week. Um, oh. Um, that's actually an interesting question. So we finished off with nutrient cycle. So anyway, um, there's a question here in the chat about Fukuoka and... Um, Fukuoka, um, one straw revolution. Let me put in 
Fukuoka. Um, well, let's just look for images. One straw revolution. This guy. So, um, so this book written by Larry Korn, One Straw Revolution, Masanobu Fukuoka, um, and has Master Cho ever met this guy and do they know each other? Um, Master Cho's natural farming comes out of Japan. So when he went to go learn his natural farming, he didn't learn it in Korea. He went to Japan to learn it. And that's why he speaks Nihongo. Um, and so he, um, yeah, so I'm assuming that somebody that knew him, I, there's never, I've never actually asked him if he has directly met him. I don't think so. Um, I don't think Master Cho and Fukuoka ever met. Fukuoka now has passed away. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very similar in their influence and what they, how they, um, you know, talk about things. Um, you know, Fukuoka's classic for the, um, no, like do nothing agriculture is what he calls it, where basically he just did a lot less, um, and really focused on the natural cycles of things and would just then eventually got famous for, um, seed balls by just taking clay and, and microbes and seeds and then broadcasting these seed balls everywhere. It's like restoring things that were that were dead. Um, so he's really famous for that. But I never hear a crossover in terms of like Fukuoka talking about, you know, fermented plant juice or, um, you know, any, any IMOs particularly, <clears throat> like that acronym. Um, it, so if you do know things about this, um, then it'd be interesting to hear, you know, um, if you ever did hear of Fukuoka talk about, you know, any of the KNF um, jargon or, you know, and, and Master Cho's methods are just very similar to Fukuoka um, in, in terms of, um, the, you know, the agricultural practices. Although although Master Cho tends to be pretty, um, what do you call it, like scientific and, and like, you know, um, he know he knows a lot of. I mean, they're both great guys doing doing good things. Let's see what this quote says. When it is understood that one loses joy and happiness, wait, who the hell wrote this? This wasn't even this guy. Oh no, it is this guy. Happiness and the attempt to possess them. The essence, the essence of. Okay, I'll just read it from the beginning. When it is understood that one loses joy and happiness in the attempt to possess them, the essence of natural farming will be realized. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation of perfection, cultivation and perfection of human beings. So apparently, farming—you know—you're you're doing it just because you want to be a um, a better human, not really that you want to find joy or happiness. And this is the old version of um, One Straw Revolution, the one that I have. That's Krishna. He farms at um, Oroville, and. This, this is the old cover of the book that I have. Um, so anyway, the Fukuoka, I'm not sure. Those good, good, interesting um, thing. But they had they shared a lot of the same philosophy and they shared a lot of the same thing. So I'm pretty sure they would have been buddy-buddy. And they even spoke Japanese, so they could be like, Ari, oh, oh, ohayou gozaimasu, and greet each other just fine in the morning. So let me check this one more time. Oh, so let's, um, I use deep mulch on the farm. Can I spread my IMO on top of the straw and cover with more straw, or do I need to expose the dirt to apply them in the garden? Um, no, stone, stone mason, just, um, just put the IMOs on top of your mulch, and then when you water them in, so the whole, um, Let's see here where this one here and then this one here. Let me pull this over here. So um, building soil foundation here. This is from from my book here on building soil foundation. And you just uh, doesn't really say here, but you just want to um, you don't want to bury it. Otherwise, you suffocate the microbes. Um, and so just putting it, putting it on the very top. And then when you water it in with the, um, with the soil formula here, um, so let's drench with the soil formula. 
um, you will um, the the microbes will move through the mulch, and they'll get down into the soil and they'll find their ways through. So it's it's a matter of applying the IMO four and then watering with the soil formula, which the soil formula is here. It has food cleanser, medicine structure, protectors, and minerals in there, and you just so you spread the IMO four over the top and then you water it down and. You shouldn't have to uh, scoot the mulch back and put it to the soil. The microbes will find their way through that mulch into your soil just fine. Okay, good questions. Good questions. And, um, yeah. So I wanted to get into water-soluble calcium phosphate here a little bit. Um, this was the next presentation after the... Um, nutritional cycle that we went over last week. And so getting into here, water-soluble calcium phosphate. What a mouthful to say. What I end up calling this recipe is KNF structure. Because the bones, bones are the structure of everything. And so Water-soluble calcium phosphate is extracted from the bones of vertebrate animals. So if you got a vertebrae and then you're extracted, except for I don't think it's from chickens, so I'm not sure what they mean by that vertebrate. As long as you have, I guess as long as, it's, it's saying don't get that from like crabs or shrimp maybe because they have exoskeletons, but anything that has a vertebrae, so you get it from... Yeah, cow. I use cow bones, pig bones. Um, you can't really use bird bro bird bones. I'm not sure birds are vertebrates. They probably are. Um, water so water soluble calcium phosphate is an essential substrate for plant growth. So essential substance for plant growth. Can't really argue with that, right? Um, you know, uh, P is one of the NPKs. You know, phosphorus, P, right? K is potassium, right? Got it right this week. Um, um, so, cal, uh, so water, water soluble calcium phosphate, all those things. That's basically what he says about it. Those are the reasons. Um, what you need: clay jar, cedar bucket. Um, I don't use either of those. I use like a five gallon bucket or a um, mason jar. Um, those are what I use. Porous paper, green paper, paper towel. I often use a paper towel. And a rubber band, which you don't necessarily need that. It's just to secure your Korean paper onto the top of your clay jar. <laughs> right? Um, so whatever you got around, five gallon buckets, um, you know, whatever vessel you have, recycle something. As long as it's clean, you're good. And some paper towels or newspaper or a t-shirt or whatever. And then something to secure that on there basically what you need. So they are talking about um, how to make it when the materials more now besides besides the um, you know other things and now you need bones and look at these nice bones. They're all nice and dried like this. Try and get bones like this. If yours still have meat or fat on them, uh, put them outside where flies can get to them. What's up Tyler? And let the maggots eat away all that material and get nice bones like this. If you are putting fatty bones with still meat on them and charring it, it's going to flame up. It's going to get all kinds of gross. And so get rid of the meat first. Nice bones that look like that from pigs, cows, um, fish bones work. Um, but bones in, 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 I know, I know somebody's going to ask, what about bone meal, right? You could use bone meal if you have the right way to retort this. So you can make charcoal, out of the bone meal. If you make ash out of it, it's no good. So you need to make charcoal out of this. So nice bones like this. Fish bones apparently work. They, they are listed here. I didn't read that, but you just need one of these. You don't need both. You don't need fish bones as well. And fermented BRV. So brown rice vinegar, or I use white vinegar. Any vinegar with a pH lower than 2.5 will work. And um, I, you know, using BRV, I don't often do that. I use it for other things in natural farming, but dissolving bones, I use white vinegar. My, my good friend Heinz, John Carey, I think. <clears throat> so 
how to make it. So after you've gotten those your buckets and your things. Oh, butter. Fresh made butter. How do you make it? Um, well, apparently cow, pig, fish bones contain much calcium phosphate. How do I know? Because it says right here. Um, after burning them at a low temperature for removing organic substances, put them into BRV for extracting inorganic substance, calcium phosphate. I don't know if you can burn things at a low temperature. And I'm never sure what, what this line exactly means. But it does remove organic substances. <coughs> Excuse me. It also creates um, pyrophosphate, which is now a water-soluble compound. So people have asked about that. So let me just GTS that and just say um, pyrophosphate. And click on our most trusted source, Wikipedia. And right here it says um, diose phosphate redirects here, but pyrophosphate, the chemistry of pyrophosphates, um, phosphate atoms in a POP linkage, pop. That's with the oxygen, right? And then here's this other crazy compound, and this one, tetrasodium. Um, High energy phosphate bound. I don't know. Acidity. Hmm. Um. Anyway. Wow. As a food additive. There's all kinds of interesting things about these apparently. And there's a lot to learn. It's not showing what I was looking for, which is basically like. Hmm. Yeah, I was I was looking for it to show how that would be dissolved into our other thing, but oh well. Um hey, what's up, Horace? What about the the marrow and the bones? Um I let my dog clean them off first. Yeah, get the marrow out of there. The marrow's gonna be gross when you try and burn that and char the marrow. It's not gonna come out good. So remove the marrow. You know, you can boil the bones first. Don't add vinegar and the boiling of bones, but you can boil them, get a bone broth. Um feed that to your dog um as well as you know get all the fat and meat and uh, stuff off there so um, boil them first then char them up so they look like this um the way i do it is in a grill starter um and i don't know if i have any pictures that i don't have any like i'd have to start this hard drive up and i don't have any readily available although maybe maybe no is that Maybe it's plugged in. Um, but basically, you got your bones charred. Um, and then that, that's all they say about it. <laughs> that's that's really like, you know, so when you're when you're learning from Master Cho and you're like just going off this um, this recipe here, I mean, this is like his presentation. That's all it says about it. It doesn't say how to like ver verify you've done it correctly. You know, it doesn't say anything about... Um, you know, how do you know it's done? How do you store it? How do you know any, it leaves, leaves a lot of questions open, right? It's just like, like there, his, his presentation is just like, here it is. Here's some little bit of information about it. it's an essential substance for plant growth. We'll just say that. And then we'll go on and just show like a little bit of like these things you need, like a bucket basically, and bones and vinegar. And then you, it says just char them after a low temperature then put them into BRV and doesn't even say the ratio, right? It just is like, yeah, add this and add that. And then, then you're done. Thanks. What's up next. Right. So, um, so this is the, this is like, you know, why I'm going over these presentations and why I'm, you know, helping to share and sh you know, some of this information and translate a little better. So let's go, let's go over to my book here and pull up my page for the KNF structure. So KNF structure, it's dissolved bones. And this is basically what I show. 
is you need some grill starters, some charcoal, some bones, some fire, and some vinegar in a jar, right? You're gonna boil the fat off the bones, get all rid of, rid of that stuff, not birds as they're too frail and light, right? Okay, we're gonna light our, our um, grill starter. We're gonna get it hot, it's gonna look like this, like, right, and our stuff in there is lit from the bottom of the newspaper comes up. I didn't list the newspaper, but you can use a torch maybe. Um, so charm, get the bottom grill starter started. Then, you know, it looks like that, right? The coals are lit. It's not like I just lit it and I put this other thing on top. I wait till the coals are lit like this, right? Like I'd pour it on the barbecue. And then I put the other grill starter filled with bones onto the top here. Then as this, this bluish smoke starts to come out of here, as it starts to burn, because these are fully lit on fire, that goes on, this burns out. Then <clears throat> after burning about a half hour, 45 minutes, right in that time zone, the smoke will go from bluish smoke to clear smoke. And when the smoke switches to being clear, that's when it's now um, charred all the bones. Like it's no longer getting toxins and inorganic material out of here, or organic material, excuse me, organic material out of here. It's, it's just, it, it's just charred this out into like pretty much, you know, cal calcium, car you know, calcium ph phosphate, carbon, whatever, it, whatever it is. And then the smoke goes clear, the bones are done, remove them from the heat when the smoke goes clear after about half hour, 45 minutes, then these bones come off here and, and then they're extinguished. Then I crush the bones with a hammer and I wrap them in a towel and I crush them with a hammer. Then I put them in here and I actually, I change this recipe from 10 to one to seven to one. Um, meaning that there'll be more vinegar than there will be for bones. This 10 to one, seven to one ratio, somewhere in here, it depends how well you charge your bones, but between 10 to one to seven to one, you're going to get a really good calcium phosphate. And it's done after seven to 10 days, stirring it daily, just to kind of agitate the solution, get it mixed up. Um, it's done when there's no bubbles and no vinegar taste. So no bubbles, no vinegar taste, very important. Then you pour off the liquid out of here into here and keep, get rid of the bones, bury them in your garden, um, crush them up. They're really, you know, put them in your potted plants. Um, they're really good stuff still. <clears throat> put them around a fruiting tree, bury them in the ground. Um, and yeah, then you got the structure. So this is my one pager. I'm showing it kind of dissolving in this versus Master Cho's slides over here. And, you know, you can decide which helped you to do it better. But understanding that, like, you know, to char the bones through and burn them all the way, it really doesn't talk much about the burning in his presentation. Whereas mine primarily talks about the burning, as it's one of the most important parts of this. Um, so anyway, a little, little bit of differences there of explaining those. Um, and yeah, when it, when it burns, this smoke that's coming off here is very, very pungent. So do not get this smoke on you or your clothes or do this inside or do this anywhere where it smells like it burning flesh. Like it's really terrible smell. Um, and then, um, Miles is asking here, have I ever diluted with some stronger acids than vinegar? Um, and he said he has some diluted with sulfuric acid, um, which would be interesting to see. I, I'm not sure that's going to take out the right things that it's going to pull out your, um, pyrophosphates. Um, I don't know if these other, how these other acids are, because then you're getting into chemistry, right? And you're trying to say like, it's not just an acid that's breaking it down. It's, it's that it's combining the right way to make things, you know, like, will it take off this sodium and will it pull this phosphorus, you know, in this, it, like, obviously it's a calcium phosphate. So I don't know which one of these, none of these have calcium in them. Um, but somehow, 2HPO. I don't see the calcium phosphate, but somehow um, it's in there. And this is one of the things of what it does. Um, 
It's interesting, the, the various diphosphates are used as emulsifiers, stabilizers, acidity regulators, raising agents, sequestrants, and water retention agents. Interesting thing on that, um, of what it, what it does. Um, and then one other source that's worth looking into right now is looking at Master Cho's other literature here. Um, hang on, let's, uh, oh, right here. Bring this over. Put this up. And try and make this a little bit bigger. So, uh, Master Cho's talking about calcium phosphate. It's extracted to the, from the bones of vertebrate animals. They've really stressed that. I don't know why. Um, yeah, and that's another good point to goof, man. I'm not sure if you use a stronger acid, how that would work on your plants later. Um, it says water-soluble calcium phosphate is an essential element or essential substance for plant growth and is widely distributed in the soil. Okay, so it's already in your soil, I guess. <laughs> the key is to get it up into your plant and into your, your animal where you need it. Um, calcium phosphate is insoluble in water, but s soluble in acids. This property is used for used in natural farming. Um, calcium phosphate can dissolve, dissolve slightly in water containing CO2. Huh. So calcium phosphate can dissolve slightly in water containing CO2. So apparently maybe if you did if you did a CO2 water, like a bubble water extract, maybe you could do this as well too without the vinegar. I don't know. Um, interesting things to think about. Um, yeah, yeah, you, Rainbow used that, that vinegar. Um... So he's, you know, bucket, bones, again, the thing. He says fermented BRV. I wonder if that's different than regular BRV. Um, apparently it's optimal to do this between 23 to 25 Celsius. I don't know why. Um, store it in the shade. It's desirable there is little change in the exterior surroundings. So you don't want the temperature to fluctuate a lot while you're doing this, I guess. Um, it says use boiled bones, not raw bones on which no meat and fat is attached. So boil it to get it off. Turn the bones into a charcoal state by burning them at a low temperature. See, I, I don't know about this. It says it here too, low temperature. Like, this is the way, I mean, burning them? I don't know. What's up, Pedro? Um, this process is necessary to burn organic and fatty substances. So again, they say this low temperature. I don't know. Something I've never done with Master Cho or seen, so we've always used just high temperature. Um, so then use the charcoal of the bones as they are or pound them. Do not pound too much or they will become powder. So he wants to avoid powder for some reason. Put the bones in the jar with BRV, 1 to 10. Calcium phosphate is dissolved from the bones. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, thank you. Hey, thanks, Stone Mason. Good to get some super chats from you guys. Oh, man. oh it's a good Sunday. Um, small bubbles will appear. If there's no movement, it means the process of the solution is complete about seven days. So, similar, not that much info on this. Um, use as, so it's how to use it. And this is what it wasn't in the other parts too much, but how, how it's used specifically by Master Cho in this book is used as drinking water, 1 to 500, for the livestock that are pregnant or ovulating. So also for, you know, human use during um, pregnancy or ovulation in your drinking water, 1 to 500. Um, use after diluting with water, the basic dilution ratio is 1 to 1,000. So normally, if you're not, it's not animal drinking water, it's 1 to 1,000, though. Um, spray the structure on leaves during the period of crossover and vegetative growth. So it's 
good on leaves, both those periods, apparently. Um, use structure when the crop overgrows. So if it gets too fat and it's too heavy, too much nitrogenous growth, then adds structure and it helps it to um, undo that like obese overgrowth type of um, function. Use calcium phosphate when the weather condition is bad, such as now when it's raining too much, um, a lot of nitrogen, extra things coming out of the ground or out of the air, out of the, you know being added to the ground, and calcium phosphate or KNF structure will help repair that structure that we need in the soil. So, um, use calcium phosphate when the initial growth is poor. So if your sprouts aren't sprouting well, calcium phosphate to the rescue. Also, um, in microgreens, you know, initial growth, you want to use it. Um, and then use calcium phosphate when the flower buds have weak differentiation. So meaning that you got the plant to grow really, really, really well, but then it's not flowering that well and you can't get it to convert over from flowering to what you want. And it's like, oh man. So use some calcium phosphate and it will throw flowers like you've never seen before. Um, it's really one of the best things to help with flowering is calcium phosphate in that changeover period that that time. So, um, so that is um, that is what I have on calcium phosphate from Master Cho from some of my recipes um, and from everybody. So kind of interesting, not too much inf information on that low temperature cooking, um, but I interesting nonetheless. Um, and so Marcus here in the chat is asking, can you make LAB from brown rice? Um, it, it's possible to make LAB from any starch, but brown rice has the hull on it and it doesn't have that starch available. Like the inner part is the starchy part. The outer part is like a shell to hold it. And so you're not going to get that much starch to make your LAB from brown rice. So you're better off to make it from white rice or just take that brown rice and put it in a blender and blend it so that you crack the hull open and then add that to your water. And then you'll get much more lacto as the starch is available. So brown, brown rice itself, you want to crack it open first. <coughs> So, is any, um, yeah, no, George, George isn't here, so we'll see. Okay, nobody is in there, just me, just me, zooming with myself. Um, okay, that would be kind of a funny meme, a guy zooming with himself. Oh, you're muted. Okay, so moving on right away to um, the next kind of similar dissolution, um, similar to the, the calcium phosphate or structure. Um, this is water soluble calcium. And so I call this CANF reproduction because this is best during the reproduction phase, as we'll see, hopefully. This will all line up with what I've said. So, water soluble calcium by Cho Global. Let's get into it. What are the characteristics of calcium? Why use it? What does it do? It contributes to the better utilization of carbs and proteins. And so, if your plant's going to grow, it needs to use carbs and proteins and build things and do all that. It needs calcium to do that better. So, Number one, helps utilize these things better. I think if you go and look at somebody and you say NPK, the next most important element will be calcium. I'm pretty, pretty sure it's NPK, calcium, manganese, stuff like that, like in, in order of importance. So calcium super important right after NPK um, in plant chemistry. Um, it prevents crops from overgrowing. So again, similar to how calcium phosphate prevented overgrowing, if things are too obese and they're, they're, they're proteins and carbs are, are stuck, then they need the calcium to help them be utilized and to go out into building structure instead of just getting bogged down and help it 
to um, avoid this like kind of obese overgrowing type of uh, characteristic. Um, it makes fruit firm and prolongs storage period. So if your fruit um, is soft, think of it like, you know, like you got a soft egg, it's like not enough calcium in the shell. You got soft fruit, it's not enough ca calcium. Calcium itself is actually a metal. Um, often we don't think of it as a metal, think of it as like chalk, but it's actually an alkaline metal, alkali metal. Um, and so putting metal into your outside um, case, imagine your fruit casing being this metal case, then it's going to be much harder for it to, you know, it'll store better because it has metal cage around it. If it doesn't, it's not going to store as well. So calcium, put that extra metal, it'll be absorbed into the outer shell and it'll protect it. Um, and then it also functions to carry and accumulate nutrients. So applying calcium, calcium very at the end of the, uh, uh, towards like, okay, so you see your plants growing, now it starts to flower, then small fruit starts to develop. Then as that fruit starts to swell, now you add calcium to it as that fruit's swelling and all those elements that want to go to the seed start going to the seed and start going into your fruit. And so calcium really um, really helps it to grow. Oh, hey, thanks, Pedro. Yeah, man, been thinking about you a bunch and some good, good times. I'll, I'll send cheers to the family, especially Sue's. Oh. Um, so this will carry and accumulate nutrients. So calcium, super vital during the reproductive period, getting into there, doing all that. Um, how do you know you need, how do you know you need calcium, right? Like what, how do I know I need calcium? Well, underdeveloped roots, feeble root hairs, your roots aren't growing that well. Calcium, I don't know, I, you know, I call it reproduction, but um, appearance of empty bean pods. So you have like fruit where there's, you know, it's not full. There's sections missing, right? Like, like you grant like, um, um, like mango steen and there's only like four things inside versus there should be like eight, you know, like, like your fruit filling out your, um, all those things. Like that's, that's a calcium deficiency. It's not able to convert the carbs and proteins into your fruits and give you good fruiting. Um, leaves discolor to a brownish color and then dry out. Sounds like rapid ohia death. Um, but, you know, if this, if this has happened, apparently you don't have enough calcium in there. This coloring. Sounds, sounds like you, you didn't water either, but, you know, hey, whatever. Um, yeah. Oh, oh so, um, um, yeah, applying, applying calcium phosphate directly to your leaves and wiping it on there can also help fight powdery mildew mark sand here. Um, and this one again talks about this low heat of where you can touch the frying pan. You know, I've found that you cook it as high heat. It's it's like roasting marshmallows. And he's showing breaking the eggshells into smaller pieces, like having the heat and doing that. The egg, eggshell membranes come off and then roasting until removing white membranes. So they're removing the membranes off it and put the roasted eggshells into the BRV slowly, cover the container with a paper towel. Um, let's see. The roasted eggshells may move up and down continuously emitting bubbles at this time. Um, at this time, the bottom of the container should not remain while they are moving up. I think that what it means is the eggshells should float all to float to the surface is what it's saying here. Um, and then the completed calcium container has nothing at the bottom and immediately filtering it before preservation. Uh, this is the weirdest translation I've seen. Um, but basically, it, it, it's no more air bubbles. <laughs> and immediately filtering it before preservation. This sounds like like a wild thing to be doing here. Um, is there an egg to vinegar ratio? It's one, it's one to ten. But again, that's it. That's that's the end. Doesn't doesn't say here. So if you're looking at just Master Cho's presentation, it um, it omits that data of how much um, 
how much calcium to vinegar. It doesn't even say, right? It doesn't even say. Yeah, none of none of this says. So, so let's. So there you go. That's Master Cho talking about it. And, and there, is there a ratio? Yes, there's a ratio. It's one to ten. So let's go over here um, to this presentation, um, which is here. This is this is my version of this. So taking about three dozen eggshells, um, outdoor cooktop, seventeen mil. Uh, mills of vinegar, half gallon mason jar, wooden stirring spatula. So what happens is you, you cook these eggshells, you cook them, you toast them. Um, so remove the membranes if you can earlier, crush the eggshells into three millimeter pieces, like really small, tiny pieces. Um, and just, just lower than on a heat, just lower than smoking is what I say. So just, just below as high as you can keep the temperature and cook them. Uh, and it takes about 15, 20 minutes and the eggshells will turn brown like a perfectly roasted marshmallow when done. And this was the key for me when I found out how much Americans love marshmallows. When I'm trying to teach this to Americans, I just say make a perfectly roasted marshmallow. Every one of them knows exactly what I'm talking about of that perfectly brown toasted color, you know, um, and that's what you want. Like you see those nice where it's turned from white to being toasted. It's not burnt. You don't want to burn it. It's just like making a marshmallow, right? You burn it, you you, you lose, right? You know, it's like an American thing. I haven't, haven't quite figured it out yet, but they know what I'm talking about. Um, so try, yeah, try not to burn it because that reduces the calcium content. Um, and then winnow, winnowing. So if you don't know what winnowing is, it means to pour from one thing into another with wind blowing through. So if I pour from one cup to another cup, back and forth like this with wind blowing, things that are lighter than air fly away. Things that are heavier fall from one container to the next. And so you just pour from container to container in the wind blowing and it'll blow away all these light membranes that blow away in the wind and it'll keep the, um, it'll, it'll keep your eggshells there so it gets rid of all that membrane and then mix one part eggshells with 10 parts vinegar by weight so here here's your ratio i give it to you right here it's not in master chose slides but here it is so that was all step one apparently step one went right here step two is to mix the eggshells um to the vinegar and then dissolve it for seven days and agitate it daily Step three is to filter the liquid out and discard the solids after the vinegar taste is absent. So you'll notice in the first three days that vinegar taste will go away. It'll just start to taste like um, calcium, basically. And store the, separate it and store it there, so with an airtight lid. So, and if you add the eggshells too quickly, it'll overflow like this bucket down here. And you need just enough cooked eggshells and the vinegar and you bubble that away. Um, but don't add it all at once, it'll slowly add the vinegar for sure um uh, and ben is asking if he can use an ostrich egg uh yeah totally man ostrich egg is good egg <laughs> you probably just need like one or two of them to make a whole five, half gallon jar so um so and then what else does he say about um calcium let's see here yeah so here's his other here's his other um thing on water soluble calcium here so um <laughs> so interesting fact here calcium is one of the most common substances in the world next to oxygen and silicon and the majority of calcium exists in the form of calcium carbonate, CaCO3. In natural farming, calcium carbonate is extracted from eggshells in which the calcium carbonate is the main component by using brown rice vinegar. Through this process, calcium carbonate is changed into water-soluble calcium, which is quickly absorbed by the crop. Um, so again, he talks about the characteristics, which he says... Um, contributes calcium contributes to better utilization of carbohydrates and proteins 
It is the major component in forming cell membranes and enables smooth cell division. Calcium functions to remove harmful substances in the body by binding with organic acids. So if you're too acidic and you take calcium, it'll, it'll bind with those organic acids and get rid of that. Um, it also helps uh, mineral absorption. I don't know if it'll say that, but um, calcium prevents crops from overgrowing, like I talked about, transporting those things. Calcium makes fruits firm and prolongs the storage period. Again, that metal in your outer shell is going to help uh, make it firm and, and store longer. Calcium promotes absorption of phosphoric acid and is responsible for the nutrient accumulation in the crop. So phosphoric acid um, helps it absorb. So again, calcium, calcium phosphate together here are going to help in that transition period. And um, the calcium will help it to add, move its nutrients from growing to reproducing. That's why it's called KNF reproduction. Calcium plays a very important role in maintaining the health of the plant. That's, I mean, shoot, you can't argue with that. It's just like a basic statement of like, you need calcium. Calcium functions to carry and accumulate nutrients. Example, carbohydrates, which have temporarily stored in branches or leaves to the final storage organ. Example, the ovary through physiological activity. So I think this is what I've just been saying, but it's like it takes it from everywhere in the plant and brings it to your fruits. It's just like that um, lipid protein that takes the juice and brings it right to your ovaries. <laughs> um, <laughs> symptoms of calcium deficiency. Underdeveloped roots and feeble root hairs. Okay, so if you're deficient, you got underdeveloped roots and root hairs because the normal protoplasm of the cell is not formed due to calcium deficiency. So you have bad roots because you have bad protoplasm or you have good roots because you have enough calcium. One or the other, right? Um, the leaves discolor to a brownish color, then they dry out. Hey, not enough calcium. Appearance of empty bean pods. I talked about this. Poor ripening of the fruit and vegetable. Excessive moisture and organic acid. Lack of sugar content. Softening of the fruit flesh. Insufficient fragrance. So all these things you want to have good fruit, you need calcium. It is, it is like, you know, if it's too wet, like watery fruit, um, sour doesn't have sugar, soft, it, it doesn't smell good. All this is fixed by applying calcium. So if you're missing those things and you have any of those symptoms, maybe it's your calcium, man. Um, leafy vegetables contract rhizom, rhizoctinia, rhizoctinia disease and poor heading, <laughs> poor heading phenomenon. Um, so it sounds like it's some sort of root disease, rhizo, right? Rhizo, the root disease and poor heading phenomenon. Not sure what that is. Never had poor heading phenomenon. But, um, you know, if your leafy vegetables aren't doing good, maybe it's calcium. That's what it's saying, right? Um, it says root vegetables, number six. Root vegetables become pithy and hollow, lack sugar content and fragrance, and last short time in storage. Lack of calcium. So if your root vegetables are decaying quickly, check your calcium. Both rice plants and barley plants suffer from problems such as excessive moisture, low accumulation of starch, lack of luster and fragrance, and low resistance to insect and diseases. So this is this is a good one. You know, for any grain type of thing, it's um it, it you're lacking calcium if you're not able to get those things in there. Like it's too wet and it rots easy and it's not starchy enough. Like even, even in growing taro, you know, it can make too much carbohydrates versus starches and um, it gets soft and it rots easy and it gets lowly and all these things, right? So even in taro, like to change the starches, I'm sure this is true in potatoes too, sweet potatoes, to turn it into a solid starch that's more resistant to rot, right? So, um, 
Ja. <clears throat> so, um, so all this, you know, that comes from not enough calcium, right? So it seems pretty vital. Calcium's used a lot. It's in the reproductive phase. So it's, it's always going chubby, skinny, chubby, skinny. And in the um, the skinny spray, it's 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 our it's our reproductive spray. It's our fruit spray. It um it has the calcium in there. So it's always it's always alternating between leaf fruit, leaf fruit, leaf fruit. I guess that's a better way of saying it. But chubby, skinny is the same thing. The skinny is the fruit, and the chubby is the leaf. Anyway, a lot of a lot of vocabulary there. Um, how to make calcium tools, you need a bucket and a, and something to cover it with, like we said. Um, he's saying the materials, eggshells or oyster shells, which contain an abundant amount of calcium. So either eggshell or oyster shell, um, fermented um, brown rice vinegar, which is, you know, a vinegar. He says the main... Co uh, calcium carbonate is the main component of eggshells and oyster shells. When ca calcium calcium carbonate acts with any kind of acid it produces carbon dioxide but acetic acid the major component of vinegar is a weak acid so it only reacts very slowly and emits an imperceptible amount of co2 a fluffy eggshell means that co2 is melting into vinegar huh That's an interesting thing there. That that could be probably scientifically broken down there of creating the correct um, calciums for you. Optimal temperature again, 23 to 25 C. I'm not really sure why. Room temperature about. It's good to have a cool place with no direct sunlight. Um, and again, little change in the environment. Um, so he says, oh man. Well, I guess we'll finish out with this, but... The methods, so he, he says to use eggshells after removing the membranes. Um, however, it's not easy to remove them. Try not to smash too many of the eggshells and roast them in the frying pan with a light flat fire. I find smash the crap out of them and have a as high as you can get at that fire. But this is what he says. It's a little bit different than how I teach it. I mean, in practice, actually, he taught it this way. He taught it with a high fire, even though his book says otherwise. Like when we did it with him in person, he's like, yeah, crank that shit up, man. Um, so lightly roasted eggshell shows a brighter color than the original. So it, it becomes this brighter color, which is like I'm saying that toasted marshmallow color. It becomes very light in weight. And um, he says, again, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to roast. Um, and then... Fill the container with brown rice vinegar, then put in the roasted eggshells at a ratio of 1 to 10. <clears throat> and he says the eggshells may move up and down continuously, emitting bubbles, and the calcium carbonate melts. And then it says the pH 4. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe the pH is going to come to 4. I'm not sure. When there's no movement of eggshells and no more formation of bubbles, the process stable of solubilization of calcium carbonate is completed. It takes about seven days. I find in practice it takes about three to four days. Just to let you know. The eggshells that still have calcium carbonate may sink and remain at the bottom. This is because there are too many materials for the BRV to melt and the solubilization process reaches a saturation point. In this case, take out the solution and add more brown rice vinegar. So apparently you can do multiple extractions if there's still calcium in your eggshells. Um, okay, and then his last thing, something to consider, is to put the eggshells in little by little and slowly into the container of BRV. If not, the bubbles can overflow by the reaction between the materials and the BRV. Yeah. So don't add it all at once, it'll overflow. And it takes about a half hour for it to mellow down. Then you can add all the rest of it in. Like So add half, then wait half hour, then add the rest half. Okay, so how to use it. Um, and we'll finish up with this, I guess. So, um, okay. Um, 
so so how do you um so i go to how to use this and then answer those questions so after diluting with water the basic dilution is one to one thousand so in general dilute at one to one thousand um the calcium is completely separated oh um it says several calciums separate completed separately may be mixed in order to enhance the effect of calcium so Apparently, if you combine a couple of these together, it's better. I never heard that before. This is the first time I've ever heard this. But you can you can combine a few of them together to make the calcium effect even better. Wow, cool. Um, calcium is very effective in crossover period when the growth of the of the crop changes from vegetative to reproductive growth. Um, spray calcium on the leaves several times after the fruits have become large to some degree spraying calcium prevents the overgrowth and yields solid fruits so spraying it right on the leaves is how it uptakes it the best here someone was talking about the roots but the leaves are the easiest way for it to absorb um, calcium leads leads nutrients to be accumulated in the flower buds and fruits as a result the flower buds become strong can prepare for high yields the following year and harvest solid and substantial fruits that year as well. So it's also, note here, it's kind of multi-generational. If you have a fruit tree and you apply it this year, next year is going to be better. And this, in, in that same year you apply it will be better, but it'll be even better than the following year. So somehow this helps set up your plant for the year following too. Um, and it can improve the taste when it's used with... Um, the can of medicine and plant juice and seawater, right? So when you combine it in this way of, this is like, I think, um, the fruit solution that's, that's there, those solutions, it's even better. Use calcium when the weather's not favorable. It's raining too much. You need to move things around a little bit. When the plant overgrows, like it's obese, you need to get those things out of there. Um, Use calcium when the initial growth is poor. So if it's not growing good in the beginning, maybe it's calcium. I don't know. It seems like you can always use this. Use calcium when the leaves discolor and lack luster. Calcium. When the flower buds have poor differentiation. So you're not getting it to flower very well. Calcium. Uh, the physiological drop is severe. Don't know what that means, but anytime, you know, you have a physiological drop. Um... Anytime fruit enlargement is slow, your fruits aren't sizing, calcium will help them size quicker, get better, bigger. Um, and when the sugar content decreases. So if your fruits aren't that sweet, calcium. So basically, you know, you look at that and it's like, well, when, when should I not use calcium? And it's like, well, no, you, you, should, you should use it all the time because basically calcium is in the calcium phosphate that we're using. It's also in... Um, the solution. So if you look at how they're combined up when you're using them, it's like, well, okay, which ones have calcium in there? Where's calcium? Calcium's this, uh, the reproduction here. So really the, the main, the main solution that has reproduction is this fruit formula here, where it's reproduction here, as well as the harvest, right? These are the two where the reproduction is used the most. Um, but if you look at it, there's also this calcium phosphate, which is in the structure, which we talked about earlier, and it's used all the time. So you're getting a little bit of calcium all the time. And when you're wanting it to go through that fruit or the, the back through the skinny phase to like kind of grow out and grow and move its energy out, push it out instead of acute, acute you know, push the energy. That's when you're going to want to add this fruit formula here or you know, reproduction into this fruit. So it's always, if you look at it, the we covered this last week, but it's always os oscillating between leaf and fruit, leaf, fruit, bloom, bloom, leaf, fruit, leaf, fruit, leaf, harvest soil. So if we go back from that, that tempo back to here, you're seeing that we're always going, uh, we're oscillating between leaf, which is this one, with all these things, to fruit, which is this one with all these things. So we're getting the reproduction quite often coming through and, and being able to have that, um, into our, our cycle. So hopefully that kind of brings it all together for you, learning a little bit more about this. We were able to cover Master Joe's water-soluble calcium, water-soluble um, 
calcium phosphate and all those things. Um, and um, I just store the eggshells in a bag under in a plant. It, it's fine. Um, they don't really rot that bad. Um, and um, applying it to the plant, it'll take it foliarly. You can apply it as a drench as well, but you, the calcium uptake through the leaves, it, it it's typically where it needs it is in its leaves, and it'll just absorb it really easily there. Um, any advice for surfactant in the foliar application? Um, you can use the soap if you really need a surfactant. I tend to not use surfactants, but this ecologically wetting friendly wetting agent is soap dawn soap dr bronner's um you can make your own it's pretty it's pretty easy you, you can't see that here the soap soap recipe here is a surfactant um i think logan's okay i should check in with him um yeah he hasn't posted anything i think 2020 kind of took him down as it took me down too it's just like man what a drag that was so lame um, you know, just getting, I mean, it hasn't stopped me from natural farming, but man, I was like, that was so lame, all that whole thing. Um, and, um, yeah, adding, uh, Chidosan and sesame seeds recipes and such. Yeah. Keeping the, putting those out there, not letting them slip through the cracks. Yeah. So maybe I'll add that. Thanks, Goofman. And thanks, Pedro, for tuning in. Thanks. Thanks you guys all for New York, what's up? Um, okay, cool. Well, I hope hope you guys enjoyed. Hope we created more union between us, between everybody, um, you know, in harmony with the sage. Thanks, Master Cho. Thanks to Pure KNF Foundation. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for the super chat, Stone Mason Bird. You guys really, man, you know, it's nice. It's nice to have it come back, have union, have it be good for you and be good for me, right? Like all that, the heart of all great unions. So, I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, we'll try and get George on next week. If anyone else wants to be on next week, let me know. Um, I got the Zoom. We can do it. We can uh, get into all this. And um, just want to wish you guys all happy, happy week. And uh, as always, you know, long live the natural farmer. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I got to do the, the closed curtain. You ready? Ready for this? Goodbye.